Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. All right, well, I put the talk off until Tuesday. Try to do it on Monday, but Kierkegaard, that son of a gun, seemed like he was too much for me. So I had to give him a little more time. And uh, so we're going to do kind of a kind of a look at Kierkegaard today. Happy belated Juneteenth and Father's Day to you all. Um, sorry I missed it. I had a good time with my kids. I took them to see that movie Elements. And uh, so that was fun. Um, yeah. Tuesday, folks. So I hurt my wrist moving, and then I took a, um, a muscle relaxer, just a quarter of a muscle relaxer to kind of help. And then I think I hurt it again. So now I have a keep my. And it's weird because it doesn't hurt until like I like, pick up a can and like move my hand like a quarter of an inch, and then all of a sudden like jumping through the roof. So. This move has, has made me realize that I'm not Superman. Surprise, surprise. The great thing today is that we have one w person watching, and um, it's, it's Don. Hey, Don. <laughs> and, uh, and today is about the individual, so there you go. Um, so a few weeks ago, when I was moving, I sold a ton of books, um, because if you know anything about books, they're really heavy. And um, so I sold a bunch of my books. And, um, but then I was waiting at chapter 11. Oh, they could sponsor us because they'll take anything. Um, I found this book. And when I was in the store, I was just flipping through it. Doo, 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 and I found a page. And I found this one little page, which is going to be part of the talk today. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I like, start looking for paper and I think ripped like a receipt out of my wallet and threw it in there, put it in and bought the book. Um, and was like, oh, I want to use this. And Kierkegaard's name is not on the cover, but that's who we're going to be talking about. And um, this is, you know, basic writings of the ex existentialism, many never before translated. Of course, this book was probably very old from the looks of it. Um, but yeah, that's what we're going to, we're going to kind of talk about Kierkegaard today. And, um, like I thought like that would be like, but I had the kids and I was in aches and pains from this move, which hopefully eventually there'll be pictures all up here. But, um, you know, it's kind of hard to like balance and hammer with the hurt wrist. So I've been trying to do things I can do. I did move a bookshelf last night, but I kind of slid it. I think I broke a glass, which, uh, fixture, which I might be in trouble for. Fantastic. Anyway, good morning, good afternoon. It's, I believe it's like almost three o'clock my time. And, um, I don't even have, like, it's funny cause like I packed, like I was like, I'm going to pack my Bible last and my notebook last so I don't lose it. But now all the stuff I packed last are still in boxes. So like I've got this old notebook I found and, and my old, um, smaller Bible that I found that was actually red, but I painted black. I see a red Bible, I want to paint it black. Um, so let's, yeah, let's jump into this. It's, it's hard because I don't know a whole lot about Kierkegaard, but I know that I really like what I'm reading here. And what we're reading about is, um, strangely enough, is about the individual. And and the importance of the individual versus uh, the importance of a group. And one of the things that <clears throat> that really sparked this for me, um, well, one is like how often we are willing to get behind certain things, even if, if it supports our group, but maybe not necessarily someone else's group. I remember seeing that a lot in church growing up. And people would be like, well, they're not gay affirming, but, you know, it's my home church and they're really great and they support me and my my family and 
you know, and and then, you know, you see LGBTQ folks, people are like, oh, we really, you know, oh, look, Starbucks supports us and Chick-fil-A doesn't, but then like Starbucks doesn't give good workers. I mean, I think they do give insurance, but obviously they don't let workers unionize. Um, so it's just really wild how we have like what we, what way we think and group think and then the way we think like, you know, like individually. And so we're going to talk about that today. But one of the things that made me think about this is um, I've been reading this book and I stopped reading it. And then somehow a podcast came on and another article came on about all these men um, in, in their 40s who are taking their lives. And, and I think the hard thing about that is, is I'm, I am that age. And a few years ago, I did try to take my own life. And thank God I failed. Um, but, you know, there's this something happening. And I think that a lot of, you know, people like in the 90s, especially me, like growing up as a kid, there was this message of like, be independent and think for yourself. And, you know, but it was, it was like very progressive thinking, you know. And I think a lot of us went in that way. And then I think somehow... Um, a lot of things about men have been said, oh, this is bad, this is toxic, this is wrong, you know, and a lot of, oh, you know, cisgendered males, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and the research shows like an abnormal amount of cisgender males in their 40s, or just males alone, not even, you know, just males are killing themselves because they don't feel like they belong, that life doesn't seem to help them anymore. And, um, and so this kind of got me thinking a, a different way, but then, then I read this, started reading this, and it kind of took me in another way. So we're just going to, you're going to kind of see how my mind kind of goes, whoop, whoop, and connects weird dots, and maybe you can connect those dots yourself. But um, these are definitely things, as a community of folks who want to see the world change, is we want to see people survive, you know? We want to see people have lives that um, are peaceful and, and, and that aren't full of doubt and scared and horror, you know, and, and fear. And, and causing them to just say, I don't want to be here anymore. Um, I know what it's like, and I know what it's like to have children and go through that, you know. And um, it's, it's, a hard, it's hard to make it today. And I think one of the things we have to look at, and it's easier probably to look at as individuals than as groups, but often we don't realize how much the group does our thinking for us. But as individuals is, is like going like, oh, man, like, are we part of the problem? Are we part of like hurting this group going like, you know, I had a friend of mine saw an article that was raised, wrote on this and I saw my friend and my friends like, oh, you're not getting enough pension guys, cry me a river. And I was like, really hurt. Like, I was like, really? Like this is like, you know, oh, all these men who've been, you know, you know, and it's like, people don't realize this is like, it's it, these men who've been in charge and things like that. Like, that's a minority of a majority. You know, like these aren't like a lot of us have worked crappy jobs and bookstores and things like this and had hard lives and things too. So, um, but just this like whole disconnect and how like, well, the group thinks like this group is kind of bad. So we should say they're kind of bad or they've had too much, you know, favor in the past. So we should tell them like they're, they've had too much or we think these type things are, you know, and you, 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 <clears throat> you miss the individual and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. And, um, it's, 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 it's interesting. The individual. Boop, boop. Um, We often believe that the group, <clears throat> or group thinking, has the truth on their side. Like usually like, well, if the majority thinks it, you know, and it all just depends on what time you've probably grown up in or different things like that. You know, there's a counterculture and things like that. And then we see countercultures change into cultures and the new countercultures come out of that, culture cultures. But this, you know, but we often believe like, oh, well, if the group thinks it, you know, oh, well, the mega church, they must have the correct doctrine because so many people are driven to it and we all know we all know right we all know um we all know <laughs> um we often believe the ground <clears throat> you know the, 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 so that the, the the group has this truth in their side you know majority of voters and maj the majority rules and all these type of things but Kierkegaard when he talks about the individual really argues against this 
So what's really great is if you get upset during this talk, you can be upset at Kierkegaard and be like, and if you love it, you can be like, oh man, Jay found this really weird thing, this weird book in this bookstore. And what a good job. All right. So, but look at these. <clears throat> um, but for me, I was thinking about like, okay, so the individuals and, and how we would say bad individuals and we would think like, oh, well, there's like, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think of bad individual, well, obviously you think of Hitler, who's probably the baddest individual, um, you know, but people will think of like, oh, well, like depending on whoever their, uh, I suppose said denomination, whoever their um, political party is, probably whoever the president is, on the other side or running is the bad individual. Um, you know, oh, Donald Trump's, you know, I saw this, saw this, I saw this comedy skit thing that somebody sent me and it was like this guy who's like, I don't see anything. I don't, I don't see black or white or tattooed or straight or gay. You know, I don't judge anybody, you know, and he's talking about it and, he, and it's being really funny because he doesn't know how to talk to people because he's not pretending like he doesn't see what they look like, you know, and so he talks to a, you know, a gangbanger like he's talking to a grandma and then talks to a grandma like he thinks she's a policeman and all this stuff. And then he shows a picture of um, Donald Trump and he's like, or not Donald Trump, a guy wearing a Donald Trump shirt. And he's like, well, except for this guy, this guy's a piece of shit. And the point is, is like, we always, we always sell tolerance, you know, like we have tolerance in a group and we all accept like, okay, well, but there's certain people who don't get tolerance as we talk about tolerance. And as long as we all think it, then it's group think and then it must be truth. And he's pointing out, the, the guy was pointing out like this, no, this is a complete contradiction. This is hypocrisy. Like you can't say like, oh, I don't see these people unless they have like the group I don't like's name on their t-shirt or the person I don't like's name on their t-shirt. And I know I, I push everybody here to think differently, and, but that's the point. Like, you know, why, why think the same? Um, so, but we think about all these bad individuals or, or like um, uh, Elon Musk or something like that. And, oh, yeah, he's a bad guy or or um, the guy who runs uh, Facebook, or the guy who runs, I can't think of all their names. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, unfortunately, uh, unless I wanna blame them for something, and right now I'm trying to be nice to them, so I'm having a Freudian blank. Um, but, but the thing is, is like these people require the group, and a group think, they require the group think of going like, ah, Amazon's bad, but we all go home and we all know and we all give ourselves and each other a pass to order whatever we want. Oh, but it's so fast and it's so convenient, you know. Um, today I was having this like drop thought about like, oh, like the support of LGBTQ people of by, by um, Starbucks, but then like Starbucks doesn't support workers. You know, and I was sitting home, but as I sat in the Starbucks drinking the giant iced tea, you know, so it's just funny, like all the, the times we run into all these contradictions, even in our own lives. Um, but a lot of these people needed a crowd think to get them to a certain place, you know? And like a lot of us needed, um, you know, they needed us, you know? Oh, an electric car. Oh, we're going to do away with the gas people. But the fact is, is we're always having to try to choose the lesser of evils, you know? And, uh, you know, oh, now we make fun of people who drive the gasless cars because we don't like the owner. And, oh, what, you know, I'm not here to defend or offend either of these people right now. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what today's talk is about. But the point is, is like they all got there somehow in a place of influence where we're looking at them. And I'm sure it was everybody but you that helped them get there. Like, I remember when I signed my, one of my second or last, the second to last or the last book, and the book companies were freaked out. And they were like, oh, it's all going electric. Amazon's destroying the book. You know, the bookstore is going to die and no one's going to read a paper book ever again. You know, in five years, you know, no one, you know, paper books will just be gone, you know. And it's funny because that didn't happen. But, man, they were in such a panic and so afraid of, like, and, and it's funny to see how hysteria starts and, and, and how we see things like that. I don't know what that had to do with anything. But, anyway, that was my side note. So I, I want to read from, from Kierkegaard's thoughts on the individual. And honestly, it's funny because I was marking this thing up and I was kind of marking it up like I do in my Bible, just like some highlights and little things like this. So we're going to have the existential, existential, existentialism Bible today um, by Walter Kaufman and reading from um, St. Kierkegaard. Um, 
so stick with me on this. I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I'm still in the middle of the, like I'm, the move, I've made it, so I'm really happy I made it, but I'm still like, it's just still tough, man. It's tough to dad and do all this stuff. Like just life, folks, I'm with you. It's not easy. Um, <clears throat> so here we go. And I'm, I'm reading Kierkegaard's words uh, about the individual. There's a few of life which conceive that where the crowd is, there is also a truth and that the truth itself is there is need of having the crowd on its side. There is another view of life which conceives that whatever there is, whenever there is a crowd, there is untruth. So that, <clears throat> to consider for a moment the extreme case, even if every individual, each for himself in private, were to be <clears throat> in, the <clears throat> in the possession of truth, yet in the case they were all to get together in a crowd, a crowd which any sort of decisive significance is attributed a voting noise, an audible crowd, untruth would at once be evident. For a crowd is the untruth. In a godly sense, it is true eternal Christianity. Um, he talks about St. Paul saying he's the one that runs the race, the one that does this, the one, and he's saying like there's this individual thing here of the individual being very important and, and the, you know, you individually have a relationship with your understanding of God. You individually have a relationship with the other and then the group sets another thing, you know. And I know that like when I don't, if I'm afraid of saying something online or saying something during a talk, if it makes me nervous, you know, it's not that it's not true it's that I'm afraid, and it's not that I'm afraid of some person getting upset because I upset people all the time. It's the group. It's the group that frightens me. It's the group that makes me think, you know, oh, this group could cancel me if I don't say this the right way, you know? And I've had it been threatened to me, you know, and lots of direct messages telling me, like, if you go this, we're gonna, you know, make a, do a campaign, you know, you're I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to read you a little bit more of, of, of Kierkegaard and do a little comments on it. So, Or you could just buy this book and, and read this chapter because it's pretty good. Um, the thing about Kierkegaard is like, it's like, oh, I understand this. And then it's like, all of a sudden it's like, he must be getting ready to, to expound on this. And then he goes into this thing and it's like, I don't understand two paragraphs I just read after that. So I'm like, I have to go back and read those two paragraphs again. And again, and, and it's funny because I, I read an, uh, like just kind of an autobiography recently and then I read another like kind of like, uh, it's not a self-help book, what was it? It was, um, um, but it was like a really encouraging book uh, by the guy who produced the Beastie Boys and all that stuff. And um, <clears throat> so then I got back into reading philosophy again and I always forget how dense it is and how rich it is and how much you like have to like spend so much more time with it than like a, a normal book. Um, so here, Kierkegaard says, true enough, it is, for more, it is far more likely and is true also with respect to all earthly and material goods if it is allowed to have its way. This because only the true point of view for it does away with God and eternity with man's kinship with the deity. So he's talking about, and I skipped a, let me, let me read a little bit more from the beginning. How unreasonable that only one attains the goal. For it is far more likely that many, by the strength of united efforts, should attain the goal. And when we are many, success is more certain, right? Yeah. And it is easier for each man severely. True enough, it is far more likely, and it is true also with respect to all earthly and material goods. If it is allowed to have its way, this becomes the only true point of view, for it does away with God and eternity and with man's kinship with deity. It does away with it or transforms it into a fable. Now, I think what's really interesting is where he says it transforms it into a fable is like, for me, 
when I experienced legalism the most is when it was like group thinking. When I didn't read the Bible for myself, when I read the Bible because I wanted to how everybody else was, like I put on the, the group glasses, the denominational glasses or the traditional glasses, you know, and this is how you think. And, and even like talking to my dad, you know, when I was talking to my dad, my dad called me and we talked recently, which was really cool. And I sent him a Happy Father's Day message, and he sent back a Happy Father's Day message to me. On so that's baby steps, right? Reconcile, argue. Well, we're trying that. Um, but it, it did. It said become like it's more. You know, religion became religion. You know, Christianity became religion. It became more of a. I don't do this, and I don't do that, and then I go here on this day, and then I don't. You know, and I don't drink or smoke, or screw or go with girls that do. You know, that kind of thing. You know. That was a rhyme my parents used to hear in the 50s and 60s. I think it wasn't screw. I think it was chew. I, mean, I think screw would be a little too radical. But it does away with it, transforms it into a fable, and puts it in its place, the modern, or we might rather say the old pagan, notion that is to be a man is to be long to a race, endowed with reason, to belong to it as a specimen, so that the race of species is higher than the individual, which is to say that there is no more individuals but only specimens. And so that happens often in, in, in this type of group thinking is, is, is we become these like type of specimens. Um, you know, uh, insignificant to the crowd. You know, it's like voting, you know, in a lot of places like here, if I was a conservative, you know, um, and I, my vote wouldn't count, you know, and in a lot of most places I've, I've lived in, you know, I didn't feel like my vote really made a difference. You know, I lived in Georgia, vote didn't make a difference there. I lived in New York, you know, I was just voting with everybody else and you don't feel like the individual's impact is felt, you know, and, and you feel disenfranchised a little bit, you know. And, and that's often the thing. And, and it's funny because in these group thinks, we often hold the leaders at fault. You know, so when the group fails or the leader, you know, and that's part of leadership. Or if the leadership, fall, or the leader falls or something like this, they're banned and beat and bruised and oust. Because that's what happens when we become a specimen. We become either a useful specimen or an unuseful specimen. It, it's no longer a person. It's no longer a relationship. It's no one that we're now that we're entering into an intimate relationship with. There is no longer a deeper truth, you know. I mean, how beautiful, and I, I would say a lot of us have experienced this. I mean, I remember back in the day when I used to be up all night and be young and drinking and smoking my cigarettes, and, and, and we'd all, we, we would all, like, sit up late and philosophize to the best of our ability about, um, about life, about the future, about hope about whatever, you know, about what we wanted out of life, what we didn't want out of life. And there was this beautiful truth, even though if it was misguided, youthful truth, there was this really beautiful truth that was earnest and alive in the room, you know, that one-on-one -on -one or that one-on-one, -on just a few people um, that we often don't get on the group think. You know, I remember early on with pastors being like, I remember sitting in a room with pastors uh, in my 20s and going like, guys, what if there is no hell? You know, what if this is kind of a trick? And a couple of the other pastors going like, I know I think I, f I feel the same way, but I could never say that in public, you know? Now I say that crap in public because I like to get in trouble and I like to get the group mad at me. No, I don't like that. It just happens. Um, usually the group that gets mad at me is the ones that like to write checks to non-denominational ministries uh -oh. <laughs> or gatherings and then they take them away. <laughs> take you away <laughs> so and that makes my life a little bit harder and then everybody doesn't want to be around me uh, no but so this the, the, this idea of uh, of this individual truth is it, it, kind of interesting but this idea of just being like a specimen a species you know like oh okay well we're just going to divide you into groups at this point and I feel like that's what we do a lot um, like we just take it down to like this basic thing of going, oh, okay, well, um, it's like you're, you're, um, it's like, okay, well, you're, you're trans, 
so we're gonna put you over here with the crazy liberals and okay well you're hetero white okay okay what bands do you like oh okay well you're uh, you bud light no but all right we'll put you over here with the conservatives you know um you know and we kind of do this like how do we how do we whittle these down, everybody down to being specimens of just kind of like, you know, and the weird thing is I remember meeting this lovely transgender man and my work with uh, Soul Force, who was conservative, <laughs> at least physically conservative, was a gun owner, <laughs> went out and shot guns, lived in Texas, loved Texas, you know, um, had a beautiful wife, you know, all this stuff. You know, and a trans male. And it was just things you don't get in the group think, or things you may have get the individuals that shine in the group. Those are the people you remember, you go, oh, oh. Like, we really are asking for equality, not political equality. We're just asking for each other to love each other. Oh, this is even better. This is even better because there's room for people who think differently. I mean, I remember just being very excited about that. And then wanting to convert them to my progressive liberal ways of thinking back then. Um, <laughs> oh no, I will not go shoot guns. <laughs> I'm going to read on a little bit. I'm going to jump around here. Uh, he, the great examiner, says, the only way to attend the goal, meaning God, that means everyone can and everyone should be this way, but only one attains the goal. So he's saying, like, in the verses and the scriptures, Paul is always talking about the one who attains the goal, which I mentioned earlier, and that's a very individual thing. And I feel like Christianity always flip-flops back and forth. It's like, personal Jesus? And then it's like, no, no, not personal Jesus. It's going to be groupthink Jesus, you know? And I would say, to be honest with you, you like, it'd be probably best off if it was personal Jesus in some ways, and you learn, but you learn from smart people and you think for yourself um, because I, I've just never been in a group of Christians where I agreed with everything they said. I don't even know if I've ever been in a group of people where I agree with everything they say. You, know, you agree on these big issues, but then there's these smaller issues, but these smaller issues make difference too, you know, but these smaller issues aren't even allowed to be talked about in the group because you won't be in the group anymore. So the group often rules with an iron fist. And I've seen this more so lately with progressive and liberal group think than I even have conservative think. So it's not always who you think it's going to be. Um, since to work for the eternal decisive aim and possibly the only where there is one and the one is which all can be to let God be the helper. The crowd is the untruth. So like... Kierkegaard is hitting the crowd pretty hard here. A crowd, not the crowd, not this crowd or that crowd. The crowd now living or the crowd long deceased, a crowd of humble people or of superior people, of rich or poor, etc. A crowd, see now that he's going everybody. He's saying everybody's included with this crowd thing. A crowd in its very concept is the untruth by reason of the fact that it is renders the individual completely impotent and irresponsible, or at least weakness weakens their sense of responsibility by reducing it to a fraction. So you get reduced to a fraction. Your responsibility gets reduced to a fraction. Are you playing along with us or not? You know, and that the part that goes along with us is the fraction that we want. Um, I don't want to be a fraction. You know, um, I don't like being judged on like the history of what people of my race and my gender have done. Like that's because that's not who I am. That is a fraction of who I am. A very small fraction of who I am. And I think my work speaks that. I think my life speaks that. Um, but unfortunately, group thinking goes, oh, no, no, no. That's just, oh, that's just your privilege talking. You're just feeling lack of privilege. You know, I mean, everybody's like a psychiatrist and psychologist now. Like, oh, no, that's just, your you're in denial. You know, I'm like, no, you know, like, this is why I spend a lot of time by myself reading books because I want to know more, but people, people can be kind of scary. And the thing is, a lot of us do this group thinking out of fear, the fear of belonging or not belonging. 
you know? Um, and it's crazy, like, you know, that's, I, I see, uh, that's the interesting thing about Facebook is like, I get so many, interact with so many different groups. You know, I have a personal page is just for family and stuff. And, and that one, it's so funny to see how many conservative people are, are like related to me and friends with me and how they think. And then like, but on my normal, my, my public page is like, God, I get everybody. Like some people are just like, lack all sense of humor. Uh, some people think I'm like uh, rich mega pastor hiding behind a facade. I mean, it's really bizarre. Like the things that, the perceptions that we see, the, the stories we tell ourselves about others. Um, but what happens is that our group thinking says, well, that's what that type of person is because they have tattoos, they're a pastor, blah, blah, blah. But that's what happens when we, 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 we forget about being an individual as we don't relate to the other as an individual. We, we start to think of them and how does, our, how does my, my group think about them? How does my, you know, my, my um, yeah, how does my group think about them? How does, how, does, how does my denomination think about them? How does my, you know, um, tribe think about them? You know what I mean? Like, and that becomes the truth, you know? It's like, or... That's kind of like the point, I think, of um, Romeo and Juliet. You know, these two families completely separated and then to each other find the individuals and they fall in love and then they, it's horrible because they kill themselves because they think they can't be together, but they could be together. You know, it's like just, it's tragedy. And what shows is like how group thinking keeps us from living our best lives in a lot of ways. God, I know this isn't popular because I, I, I know I've been to a lot of places lately, or not lately, <laughs> the last time I attended church, um, which has probably been maybe 10 years ago, um, was uh, with a lot of people saying like the individual thinking is what's getting us all in trouble. Um, but for me, like when I did even work, when I've done my LGBTQ work and things like that, what really was impressive was um, a lot of our work was not as effective when we came as a group. That was what we did secondly. Our first form of nonviolent action was to meet with people in a small group and try to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with each other and tell stories. And that's where I saw the real effects of the places where we got to do the one-on-one -on -one interaction and talk to other families and even share meals with other families. And that's where you saw like something radically happen, some change happen, some sort of maybe tolerance or some sort of like new thought came to, you know, and, and people seeing each other as people, as individuals. And it's really beautiful because a group can be very scary. You know, it's like, oh, there's a group, or, you know, I don't want to go to the, you know, the Republican convention. I don't even want to go to the Democratic convention because I'm just would be afraid of everybody because I know their ticks and I know their ticks and I know I piss both of them off for different reasons, you know. Um, you know, you're constantly like, oh, am I going to get yelled at? Um, but I don't want to be a fat fraction. But the TV and media and social media allows us to be fractions. And, and fat fractions. Fractions, yeah. And, and it puts us into factions. And, 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 and like I said, it's just a fraction of who we are when we're part of these groups. You know? Um, like we just saw some of these denominations say they won't accept people who even... Aff believe it's okay to be gay in their churches anymore. And you saw these pastors saying, okay, well, I've been a part of this group, but now I have to leave this group because the group has stepped over the line and this is not a fraction I want to be. And so he spoke out. The individual was caused to speak out and speak truth to the group. So they, and then they were forced to leave. So there's your group thinking, folks. It's not always the best. So over on page 94, um, I'm trying to keep this all brief because it's really strange to be reading Kierkegaard rather than the Bible, isn't it? But it's kind of fun. So a crowd, a crowd which has no hands, is the next place for the falsehood, is that the crowd had the courage for it. For no one of an individual's was ever so cowardly as the crowd always is. Now this is Kierkegaard speaking. For every individual who flees for refuge into the crowd and so flees into the cowardness from being an individual. And I mean, I feel this to the bone. You know, I feel this so strongly because there have, you know, I am, when I move into my crowd, and, I, and I've kind of made it so I don't have a crowd where I've been trying to, let's think different. Let's have, 
you know, diverse thoughts as well as diverse sexualities and colors and things like that, you know, like, you know, let's not just be part of this group or that, you know, let's have diversity of thought and diversity of ideas. Let's be, let's have conservatives here and, and Democrats here and everybody here and, and then let's argue, but we'll argue well and we'll argue with respect, you know, and it's like climbing up, it's like climbing up a gigantic mountain that's like almost impossible sometimes. Um, because everybody knows who the real bad guy is. I mean, you think you think you do, and then they think they do. And there you go. Sit down individually and talk it out. Oh, I get too mad and too angry. Why are you getting mad and too angry? Because you don't have, a, you're not able to have a conversation. Like we've just learned to stick with the group, so we just think whatever they say is good, and then we just repost it, and then we're fine. You know. Um, the crowd. <laughs> Take the highest example. Think of Christ as the whole human race. All the men and women that ever were born are, or, or to be born. But let the situation be one that challenges the individual, requiring each one for themselves to be alone with him in a solitary place and is an individual to step up to Christ and spit upon him. What? I didn't see that coming. The man never was born, to never will be born with courage or insolence enough to do such a thing because this is untruth. Saying, you know, people will be insolent to do such a thing. Um, what was that, page 94? So the crowd think, you know, he's saying because the crowd think is 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 crucify him, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I've never, never knew him. You know, even his own disciples were, oh, I never knew him, you know. And, and it, it, he's saying this is the cowardly way to go. It's not Christ. -like. You know, Christ is this individual. We are individuals. We've got to treat each other as individuals. I know I'm beating a dead horse, but let's jump into um, this next page here. Uh, Kierkegaard here says, he is the truth which relates itself to the individual. And I want to say this, like uh, for me, like God's more of the ground of being than a man in the sky. Um, this might be your higher power or things like that because we have people who think diversively even have diverse faiths who, who, who come to revolution. Uh, yes, I am admittedly a Christian. Uh, I, I'm probably not what you would consider a confessional Christian, but I am a Christian. And, and so, you know, there, you, you, you've got, we're all, thinking together, going from, coming from different places and coming together with what I hope that revolution is the idea of a revolution that will cause people to come together and not continue to separate others. And maybe that's why we'll never be a big group. I don't know. Um, so, for it, is, for it is not so great a trick to win the crowd. All that is needed is in some talent a certain dose of falsehood and a little acquaintance with human passion. And so, you know, he talks about, like, how we win crowds. And, you know, you look at things and you can go, like, hey, man, if, like, like, if Joe Biden can win a crowd, you know, and Donald Trump also can win such large crowds and separate this country, it's like, you know, it's not that hard to manipulate a crowd is all I'm saying. Um, and it gets a lot lonely when you're not in that group. Like for me, I'm really disillusioned by the, uh, by the Democratic Party, like really majorly heartbroken and disillusioned by them. And that's been my party of most of my, all my life. And, um, <laughs> and I'm not jumping over to the conservative party either, you know. Um, and, and, and so it's tough when you start to see that stuff. When you start to see that, oh, I'm being lied to here, you know, uh, none, none of this stuff has come to pass that we keep talking about. The dream is, is never realized, you know. We never get to the promised land. Um, goes on to say here that the God-fearing work of the witness to the truth is to engage himself, if possible, with all, but always individuality, ally, individuality. 
taking to everyone severely of the streets and the lanes, talking to everyone severely on the streets or in the lanes, in order to dis disintegrate the crowd or to talk even to the crowd, though not with the intent of educating the crowd as such, but rather with the hope that one or another individuals might return from the assemblage and become a single individual. Like that's the hope of the crowd. That's what he's saying. That was Jesus' hope of the crowd, you know? I mean, Jesus was hoping that the, someone in the group, someone in the, would, would hear that and be drawn to him. The individuals would return. And I think one of the things that we really hope here at Revolution is, is that people will be drawn to the individual conversation, the tough conversation. You know, like me and my dad almost didn't talk for four years, and now we're talked a little bit, had a really tough, tough conversation. It was really not, I don't know if it was, it was healing for me, but it was really tough. And now we've sent each other a few text messages while we won on Father's Day. It's not easy. Okay, so what, what we're talking about here is not easy. Um, it's probably not even for group thinking, obviously. <laughs> um, it's hard to draw a crowd with this kind of, like, you know, thing, you know. Um, uh, Pete Rollins is one of the people who helped me, you know, kind of understand the scapegoating stuff. Also, the work of Dr. King as well. But I, I always say, like, man, if you had just let me go off and just be, like, a left person who just bashed the conservatives all the time and talked about how horrible the church was, I could really um, probably have made a better living than what I'm doing now. Like, I don't even blame the LGBTQ stuff anymore. Like, that was, that was a long time ago. I did that work, and a lot of people are doing that work now, and it's fantastic to see. Um, you know, for me, it's like, oh, dude, I should have been, you know, if I at least stayed with one group, I could have had a little bit more popularity. And it's a joke, because I could never do that. Um, but the hope is with the, original, the individual return to the assembly and to become a single individual. Um, that's the hope of, the, of, 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 of when Jesus is talking to the crowd, when we're talking to crowds, when we're doing this, is that people will feel something, you know? And there are times where it's really fantastic, like, to feel something when you're in a band, in a community. Um, go woke, go broke. Um, um, and, like, things like that. Like, I don't like that. I don't like the go woke, go broke. I don't like the, you know, like, it's like, it's all scapegoating because there's some great, fantastic woke people. Like, wokeness started out really awesome in the, you know, in, like, the 70s and 80s and, you know, probably even earlier than that in the African-American and black communities, you know? Like, it was kind of a cool thing and it was for people who are really in the know, you know? But that's also just, like, assuming we're just that group. Do that, and we won't. This group won't support you. It's more of us, us and them. Shit. Sorry, everybody. There was just a comment on there, and I'm just responding in a passionate way, but hopefully in not too of a harsh way. Um, you know, I mean, and it's funny because what one group of you think is woke is like, you know, why don't you just really study that company and see if they have any other ways where they're hurting people in their factories or their an actual company that puts people second and finances first. You see what I'm saying? Um, um, yeah, Joseph, the, the all caps, make it seem like you're yelling, that's all. All caps, that's, when I read all caps, I think someone's yelling at me, that's all. Um, just quoting, just talking back to someone on, 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 the, on the video, um, just saying that for the people listening. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, the, the idea, that threw me off a little bit. Sorry, everybody. Um, the idea here is, yeah, that we don't, like, you know, th these companies hurt everybody. Like, who cares? Like, yeah, this company, like, oh, Apple, they affirm, yeah, they have children in mines digging up crystals. This is things that we should actually be concerned about. This is, should be the things that the reason you stopped going there and stopped purchasing. I'm doing this on an Apple device right now. You know what I mean? It's like, these are reasons we should stop supporting people. You know, these are reasons we should stop buying diamonds. Oh, I've heard that before. But, but all we care about are these little surface things that appease the group. And so, oh, well, go woke, go broke. <laughs> you know, it's like, how about go to sweatshops, go broke? How about, you know, don't give good rights to workers, you know? How about not giving them pay, good pay, livable wage, go broke, you know? 
Like we're all still driving to McDonald's and they're not always giving the best wages to their employees. You know what I'm saying? It's like, why don't we think that way? Why don't we think about like how people putting food on their table and feeding their children? You know, we're more worried like, oh, if they support people who have sex with different people than me, then I am just, I'm done. You know, it's like how, like, I, it's so funny because you see like a flag on a door of a store and someone's like, I'm not going to go there now, you know. And I'm like, it's still a freaking corporation. They're still doing really shitty things. They've always done shitty. Like that flag doesn't mean anything really. It just means that someone who's different than you can come is welcomed into that, feels more welcomed into that store. You know what I mean? It's just like, it doesn't mean that they think you're bad. It's just they're saying, hey, this is a group that we want to let know they can go, you know. Um, it's, or a place for all or things like that, you know. But usually those slogans and things like that aren't the truth. You know, you got to look deeper. You got to look deeper into those things. And that's why having conversations as individuals and thinking as individuals, it, it does that. So when I, when I see a flag, I don't go like, they're affirming. I think, oh, they're a corporation who wants business from this group of people. And right now that's what's popular. And diversity in movies and diversity in media is not because they're, oh, we're really moved. It's they're going because we want people to go see our movies. We want people to purchase this stuff. I'm sure there are people doing radical, cool things to be inclusive, but also a lot of people run, you know, a lot of people, uh, 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 you know, are, are doing this for the bottom line. Like if it's a corporation like Disney or a corporation like Bud Light or a corporate, you know, the people are usually thinking about the bottom line, you know? Um, and it's a group thing. You know, there's a group of people sitting around a table going like, how can we do this? How can we make more money? You know? And so if the group says, hey, you know, we, we're a denomination that works with conservatives, so we just got to, you know, make sure that we continue to appease the conservatives. Uh, um, I feel like maybe Joseph right now is, um, Joseph, I feel like you're going, you might be missing the point here. Could you listen to the talk? Um, I think these are good conversation pieces, but right now I don't think, I, I feel like you might be going a little hard on folks. And, and with the caps again, the all caps, it really seems like you're being aggressive. That's all I'm saying. I don't know, maybe all your cap lock is stuck on. You could let us know. Um, sorry about that, everybody. So when, 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 when Kierkegaard speaks of the truth, he goes, the truth, I mean always eternal truth, but by policing, etc., have nothing to do with eternal truth. A policy which is in the proper sense of eternal truth where make serious work of um, an individual. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Serious work of an introducing eternal truth into real life would show itself in that very same second to be the most inanimate degree, the most impolitic thing that one can be imagined. So he's saying, you know, when you try to bring in political truth or spiritual truth into the, these political things, into these policies and things like that, uh, we miss eternal truth. And so I think the idea when we think about politics and 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 group thinking is to ask ourselves, what have we become, or more more poignant is what have I become? What have I become? Who am I? What have I become? What have I given into? Am I a slave to group thinking? Um, so, so not, I'm not saying talking to groups is bad. I mean, like, man, if I'm speaking to 10,000 people tomorrow, that's fantastic. But my hope is always to reach that person individually. Um, if people can have a group, uh, have a, a great experience. I think that's why I like music. Going to music shows is that you kind of can connect to a group in a way that's very pure, that you're all touched by this music and it kind of moves beyond like what, what anybody's thinking, sometimes political, you know, because they're not always, you know, uh, and there's a mode here or it just moves beyond something that we're all like going like, hey, we're here to touch this, because this music touches us all individually, you know what I mean? We're all here and it touches us in ways that, that um, my idea had not even originally been intended to, you know, but it, sometimes it touches that, that unconscious. In 96, uh, in this page 96, I found really fascinating because um, um, 
he does he does attack the individual here. So let's let's look at that. Okay, I think it's it's, it's worth a look. Um, and, and it's basically um, on anonymous piss takes, which is cool because we have so much social media now that it's a lot of anonymous stuff. Um, the fact that the anonymous author, by the help of the press, can day by day find an occasion to say what ev whatever he pleases to say and what perhaps he would be very far from having the courage to say as an individual that every time his, he opens his mouth, or shall we say his abysmal gullet, he at once is addressing thousands and thousands what he can get 10,000 times to 10,000 to repeat after him what he has said, and with all, his, with all this, nobody has any responsibility. So he's saying, when we hide, what Kierkegaard's saying here, because I don't feel like I read that the best, um, the fact that an anonymous author, by the help of the press, can day by day find an occasion to say, even about intellectualism, moralism, or religious matters, whatever he pleases to say, and what perhaps he would be very far from having the energy to say, is he's saying, like, when we go in, and when we go in as a, as an anonymous figure, when we have an, I one time did an anonymous account on Twitter and I had to quit because I felt like I was losing my soul because I was being really mean. Um, but he goes, we often fall into that group think and we reach those groups because there's no accountability, no individual accountability, you know? And so I'm always really like, if someone's like critiquing me hard and I, and I realize like they're hiding behind a, an anonymous account, I often block that account. If I can't have a conversation, I will block the account usually because, I, you know, I, you know, there's there's all these accounts that make fun of people and they're done anonymously. And I'm like, oh my. To me, that's just like, there's just a disgenuineness to it that kind of like, mm, you know. I mean, I, I understand we. It's nice to have like whistleblowers, but these aren't people who are, who are doing anything important. They're just talking crap about a group of people, you know, anonymously and getting away with it. And and go, oh yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I even had somebody send me something in a post today that was from someone anonymous that thousands of people like, you know. Um, and it was as I was reading all this, so that was really really uh, funny. Um, so interesting, right? All right. Um, he he at once is addressing thousands of thousands that he can get 10,000 times, 10,000 to repeat after him that was said, all, all nobody has any responsibility. You know, so he's saying like, the author doesn't have responsibility. The group think people don't have the responsibility because this anonymity allows us to have something even wilder, you know? And, and, and it's like the, the, this, and in some ways I feel like it's like, you know, Fitzer, you know, when they're advertising on news and things and you realize that like the drug companies are putting all this money in news and it's just kind of like, oh, well, it's just this kind of group. I can't really, are they good? Are they bad? I mean, they've done some bad things, but they also do some good things, you know? It's this kind of hard thing to accept. Um, anyway. Dun, dun, dun. So I'm sure the group probably won't like this one. Um, the communicator of the truth can only be a single individual. And again, the communication of it, I'm reading from, from Kierkegaard again, of it can only be addressed to the individual. For the truth consists precisely in the conception of life which is expressed by the individual. And he goes on to say, received by the individual. Now this is Kierkegaard. I don't know if I 100% agree, but I know that it's interesting and it's worth us talking about and why we want to argue well. Because when we're talking about arguing well, we're not talking about arguing well with a whole group of people. Um, I don't even like to get into group texts or group chats anymore because I've realized like, you, you, the mentality of the group will usually win. You know, It's really hard to win over a crowd. And then someone will say, I'm going to be the hero of the crowd and come in and really stick it to you hard. You know? um, but let's, let's look at what Jesus said. Oh. We bring the holy book back into it. Yeah, Kierkegaard is like I'm wrestling with, but I also have like wrestled with Hegel. So I figure once you wrestle with Hegel, you can kind of wrestle with, with other these other guys as well. You know, um, slow and steady. 
So, oh yeah, to look at my notes again. So there, there's this verse where these uh, religious teeter, teachers and lawmakers ask Jesus, okay, let's trick Jesus and find out what the most important commandment is. And hey, well, Jesus, what do you think is most important? And what uh, Jesus, uh, and here it is, which commandment is the first of all, they asked Jesus. And, and Jesus, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. So that's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, the first here, O Lord of Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, by answering the way Jesus did, he's saying both of these commandments are equally as important. And basically, if you're not doing one, you're probably not doing the other. So if you can't love... Uh, people you can see, you're probably not going to love a God you can't see, you know? And um, that's actually from First John. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't me trying to take, take responsibility for that. Um, so, so this idea of loving your neighbor, the second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So here we see another thing of equality, bringing equality but that equality may not come through the group think, but through the individual of loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, this Jesus, when he said this, he wasn't thinking probably about newspapers or news shows or eventually social media, uh, eventually all this stuff, you know. Uh, um, hi, Joseph, the caps again, man, really drive me crazy. Um, just something to think about. Um, no, Jesus is talking to Gentiles too because the woman at the table, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to argue about that today. Your neighbor is, because he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, um, the woman at the well who's not seen as, as Jewish, but is seen as more of a Gentile than a Jew, um, the Apostle Paul. Anyhow, um, who reaches the Gentiles? <laughs> um, Let's look at this before this individual goes nuts. I'm just trying to figure out where this verse starts. The crowd, the court of the last resort is to deny God, and it cannot exactly mean to love thy neighbor. And the neighbor is in the absolute true expression for human equality in case everyone were in truth to love his neighbor as himself Complete human equality would be attained. Now, this is Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard saying, if everyone was truly able to love their neighbor as their self, um, truth would be attained. Everyone who loves his neighbor in truth expresses unconditional human equality. So, oh, thanks, Don, for showing up today. Uh, random Tuesday. So listen to this again. So then you have Kierkegaard, one of the greatest philosophical minds in the world, saying if everyone was to love their neighbor as themselves, we would have complete equality. But groups don't always allow that to happen. You know, he goes on to say, uh, everyone who is like me admits that his efforts is weak and imperfect, yet aware that the task is to love one's neighbor is also aware of what human equality is. So when we realize what it is to love one's neighbor, to love our neighbor, um, and not to say like, well, I love all this group or I love all that group or have this group, but to say, I love this individual. I love my friend. I love my enemy as myself. There is, uh, you know, there, there is, is, is an awareness of what true equality can be. You know, um, loving neighbor is, is a, you know, love is a, a very, can be a very individual thing. It's hard to love a group, but when, when you, so there you go. Yeah, I agree. We should do a Kierkegaard group. 
and, and hear me stumble and fall and uh, can let you guys do that too. <laughs> Not group think. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure we could talk about that all day long. Um, we all need to get together and make this law. <laughs> no group think for the group. Um, this thing of loving one's neighbor is self-denial. That of loving the crowd or the pretending to love it of make, or making it. The authority in matters of the truth is the way to material power, the way to temporal and earthly advantage of all sorts. The same time is to, un, is to the untruth for the crowd is the, uh, what is untruth for a crowd is the untruth. Um, I'm not sure what he meant by that because I'm going to have to take a... So I've gone on for over an hour now. We're going to end right here, folks. Um, but I think it's interesting that it all boiled down to love your neighbor is, the, is this great sign of individualness is loving one's neighbor. And understanding unity and peace is loving one's neighbor. Um, so I think that's really pretty amazing. Um, The crowd, in fact, is composed of individuals. It must therefore be every man's power to become what he is, and every woman's power, to become what they are as individual. From becoming an individual, no one, no one at all is excluded except he who excludes themselves by becoming a crowd. To become a crowd, to collect a crowd about one is on the contrary to affirming the distinction of human life. The, well, the most well-meaning person who talks about these distinctions can easily offend an individual. But then it is not the crowd which possesses power, influence, and repute, and mastery over men, but it is the individual's distinction of human life which is dis dispolitically ignore the single individual as the weak and impotent in which temporal and worldly interests ignore the eternal truth the single individual. So all these things is when we miss the single individual that, that like Amazon and Facebook and they are not focusing on the single individual, you know. Um, it's so funny on Facebook, I'll like one thing and then I'll get all these like wildly conservative like things from the, the um, uh, and, 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 and all these really wild conservative like advertisements and stories, you know, because I liked this one thing that wasn't normal for a, a, someone who would be more left, would think, you know, and then I like this left thing, and it's like, oh, okay, that's a little bit, you know, and it's just funny what you get. Like, I, I find liking things that um, Russell Brand talks about um, confuses the algorithms, and I think that should be a goal for all of us in life is that our life confuses the algorithms, that it advertises things to us, and different people to groups to us that we don't necessarily are part of our because it might say we're actually thinking right we're doing something different we're thinking outside the box and we're not scapegoating each other you know he also says that the individual is someone who with an intent to at least have people making notes of their individuality which i think is interesting if possible to invite to stir up the many and press through this defile the defile of the individual through which, however, no one can pass except the becoming an individual, the contrary being a categorical impossibility. And then he goes on to say, with the category of the individual is bound up an ethical importance. I may have, if the category was right, if the category was in place, if I saw rightly at the point and understood rightly that I was my task, certainly not pleasant nor thankful one, but to call attention to it. If that was the task given to me to do, albeit with in inward suffering, such as certainty are seldom experienced, with outward sacrifice, such as a man is not every day found willing to make. In this case, I stand fast, and I make my work with me, the individual. Sometimes the biggest obstacle is when trying to explain to others I am not part of this group or that group. One of the things with my arguing with my father was... Um, he couldn't understand how I was like, oh, yeah, I think the media is wrong here, 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 and they're doing all this stuff. And, and I go, well, you're right about that. 
And I think, oh, well, you're wrong about how could you believe that? Oh, you're, and he would ask me like, oh, are your, you know, those, these philosophers you're reading, are they Christians? You know, and it was like funny because we kind of was like, there was times where it was just completely like did not compute because I was saying like, no dad, like I see this, I understand this, but I also understand this. And I understand that the scapegoating is not getting us anywhere. Um, so there you go. So what I would say here is um, even like punk rock, like I love punk. But for me, punk is very personal. Like, I, I, I remember I've seen all these advertisements for the punk museum. I'm like, oh, there's not really a lot of whole ton of bands in there that I like. There's a, it seems like there's more 80s, more 90s, late 80s, early 90s punk bands. And they're, they're good, but they're just not my taste and blah, blah, blah. And so for me, it's a very individual thing and in how I think about it and work through it and, and feel it. You know, I like, really like the 70s stuff and I really like the post-punk stuff. And, and now probably what I think is most punk now is would be almost unrecognizable, you know? But I love to have that as an individual thought, but then I also would like to go into the group chat and we can all argue and have fun. Um, but ultimately I know that here I stand, you know? So here I stand with my faith, here I stand with my politics, here I stand with, um, uh, you know, uh, Christianity, you know? And, and here I stand as saying like, you know, hey, let's not let the group think rule us. Let's not be made down to a fraction of who we're meant to be. Let's not judge others and turn them into a fraction of what they should be, you know? And I think that's what happens when we, we see like, oh, these like all these 40 year old white heterosexual males, you know, are killing themselves because they've been turned into a faction of who they are. A fr uh, really a fraction, a faction. It's a fraction of who they are. And I think that's what happens with people who are like, oh, all these uh, transgender folks are this way or these cross, you know, whatever, you know, but what, what people are saying is, oh, this is wrong, you know, and, and you just, you, you've taken that person and turned them into a fraction, a fraction of who they, who they truly are. You've put it into a group. So here they are, they're like, well, there's this one part of their life and I'm going to judge every single thing of thought and idea there. Faction, fraction, they both work, don't they? Faction, fraction. So don't make them a faction, fraction, folks. You know, um, let's not do that to each other. Don't let your religion group think do that. Don't let your political group think do that. You know, step away and say, what would I say if I wasn't afraid of the community? What would I ask if I wasn't afraid that the group would disapprove of me? What would I be afraid of? Like one of the things I'm dealing with right now, and I'll end on this, is like how my son reacts to peer pressure and what he deals with. And we're having a lot of conversations about leadership and, <laughs> and not letting peer pressure, you know, cause you which way to go. And he's gotten in trouble some because he follows his friends, you know, and I did the same thing, you know, so we're having these really interesting conversations about peer pressure and, and how that r affects us and how you're worried about what your closest friends think and then how that kind of goes on to what their friends think and those friends think and things like that and what group think can do to us just growing up our whole lives. Anyhow, Thanks for those who, who made it to the end and stuck through and to those who got to just jump in and listen. I know it's Tuesday and a weird time. Um, but that was my first take at Kierkegaard. So thanks for listening. It was not, it was, it was a, it was, it was a wrestle with studying it and it was a wrestle with getting through it. And um, I'm glad we got through it. So hopefully we'll, uh, some good conversations will come out of this uh, with each other. All right, have a great week. Oh, if you like what we're doing, and you like the fact that you have a speaker who's willing to put off a conversation, put off a talk for two days in order to study rather than pretend <laughs> that I have it together like I usually do. Um, you can go to revolutionchurch.com and you can support us. We are now on Venmo. So we have a Venmo and we have a PayPal. So a lot of you are saying, like, oh, I don't like PayPal. Okay, we have Venmo. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to say, well, I don't like Venmo. I like green tree giving or whatever. You know, We'll try to get it. But right now we've got these two and your support makes this work possible um, and allows me to study these books and do all these things, raise children and uh, have, have, have a life. And I am grateful for that. To, um, uh, also to continue to challenge you guys to and all of us guys and gals to think differently. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. 
To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.